Did you know that fertilization typically happens in the fallopian tube and that embryo grows and develops across the course of the tube until it arrives in the uterus five or six days later? And that all has to happen in the IVF lab. So what we will do is watch the embryo while we keep it in the perfect culture conditions, the right temperature, the right pH with all the nutrients that it needs. But even despite that, we're gonna lose about 50% of the fertilized eggs will not make it to the blastocyst stage. So that means if we had 16 eggs, 12 of them fertilized, we now have six embryos that have reached the blastocyst stage. Well, based on your age, not every embryo is going to be genetically normal. Not that you have to do genetic testing, but genetic testing exists so that we can test the embryos before we implant them in your body. This is called PGT, pre-implantation genetic testing. Now, PGT can be used for aneuploidy or age-related random chromosome abnormalities called PGTA, and this is the most common use. We are just checking the chromosomes. Are all the right chromosomes there? We do find out sex because sex chromosomes are a part of your normal chromosome complement. But unlike popular media would tell you, we are not testing for eye color or height or sports abilities. That does not exist right now with IVF technology. We are just trying to find out which embryos have all the chromosomes that they need to become a baby. There's also PGT testing for things like single gene disorders, such as cystic fibrosis, or for balanced translocations, which is a structural rearrangement of your chromosomes that can lead to miscarriage. This is called PGTM for a monogenetic or single gene disease, or PGTSR for structural rearrangement. When you do PGT testing, what we're going to do is take about five to eight cells from the placental portion of the embryo. The embryo at the day five or six blastocyst stage is divided already into the outer surface, which becomes the placenta, and then there's an inner cell mass, which will be the baby. So we take five day cells from that outer surface or the placenta and we send those off for testing. And then it typically takes about two weeks until we get genetic testing back. In that time frame, you're gonna have a period and then you'll be waiting for your results to make your next decision. Well, if you're 35, we're expecting about half of your eggs to be genetically normal. So this means if I sent off six embryos in my example, I would expect three of them to come back genetically normal or euploid. I'm then gonna be getting everything set up for an embryo transfer. What's really important here is to also understand that an embryo transfer is typically done with a frozen embryo in today's world. And this is called an FET or frozen embryo transfer. This means I want you to think about IVF being one stage of the process and then an FET being the other stage. FET has protocols as well, meaning we can do a medicated or a controlled cycle. This is where I'm telling your body to grow the lining with estrogen. And then there's versions of a natural cycle, which is the concept that your body is ovulating while it makes its own estrogen as well. There are pros and cons to both of these that we will get into in more detail, but just knowing there's different protocols that should be chosen based on your unique situation. In either way, we've got to get to that correct implantation stage, which is about six days of progesterone exposure. So it's gonna take typically at a minimum three or four weeks of some type of protocol before you're ready for the embryo transfer. And then after the embryo transfer, you still have to wait for that pregnancy test. You're not gonna get away without a two week wait. So this entire process does take time. Success rates depend on if you do genetic testing and your age. So if you do genetic testing and you have genetically normal embryos, what we see is that with one genetically normal embryo, we're gonna have a life birth rate of about 65%. However, cumulative rates become much better. So after two transfers of genetically normal embryos, we're gonna have closer to an 86% chance of success. And after three genetically normal embryos, 95% of people would have success. So this means that one single embryo may not effectively become a baby, but if you have enough embryos, which is the big but, you can have a very high chance of having success and IVF is successful for most people. So our patient who was 35, ended up with three genetically normal embryos, has a 95% chance that she'll have one baby from those. Note how that is not three babies. So if she wanted to have multiple children, this is gonna be a scenario where we're going to want to do multiple rounds of IVF before you do an FET. Meaning I'm gonna to wanna to get this month's group of eggs, and then maybe I wanna go and get next month's group of eggs so that I can have more embryos to complete your family goal. Because it will only be harder to do this in the future. If she gets pregnant and then we're doing IVF again when she's 38, she's gonna have fewer eggs available and more of them will be genetically abnormal. 
let's say we only get 12 eggs at that time. And let's say that 10 of them fertilize and five of them grow out. Well, only a third of them are going to be normal. So she's going to get more usable embryos when she's 35 than when she's 38. Importantly though, she's still gonna probably get embryos, so it's not that it's a no-go. It's just she's gonna to have to invest more time, money, and emotional and physical effort in order to get that outcome. Well, this brings me to our next part, which is how IVF really is if you're going through it. I had a patient who came in, they weren't getting pregnant, and when we did testing, we found out they were actually both carriers for the same genetic disease. They carried something called SMA, or spinal muscular atrophy, which is a disease that causes neuromuscular degeneration, much like Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, but for kids. It can be devastating. And they talked to genetic counselors and decided they wanted to go through IVF and do PGTM testing. This means that we were going to screen the embryos to see number one, do they have the right number of chromosomes, which is PGTA, and then number two, they would also have an additional probe made for where they each carried this gene to see if the embryos had them. Well, if we were following basic science, what we should see based on genetics would be 25% of the embryos should be not carriers at all, have no copies of the gene, 25 should have both copies and be affected, and 50% should be carriers. When we think about this, we prioritize transferring non-carriers at all, but then we typically would transfer carriers because this is an autosomal recessive condition, meaning that you need two copies of the gene to be affected. Well, in their case, they had a lot of embryos in their first cycle, we sent off 10, but unlike what we would have expected, we had six come back fully affected with the disease, and we only had four that were either a usable carrier or a non-carrier state. We had one non-carrier and three that were carriers. While they really wanted a family of four, they were younger, they were pretty shocked that 10 embryos only yielded them four usable embryos. And as we said earlier, if you listen to the math, that's probably not four children. So they actually had to go through IVF multiple times. This is a great example why preconception genetic carrier screening before you even start IVF is really important because that's how they found out that they did carry this. And then having a good talk about your goals and your family plan. Because a lot of times I think they would have stopped with four usable embryos, transferred one, and then really might have struggled to get enough embryos as she got older to finalize their family. So by talking about future family goals and preparing ourselves for success, we were able to make the best decision for them. Did they wanna undergo multiple cycles? No. Was it emotionally, physically, and financially expensive? It was. Even in cases like this, where there's a genetic disease involved, insurance does not cover IVF for most people, which is unfair, but a reality in today's medical world. I also think it's important to know right now, there's a lot of people opposed to genetic testing. What would a couple like this do in this circumstance? If they wouldn't be able to do genetic testing, they might be forced to have children who could be very, very sick. Not only is this allowing them control in planning their family, but also helping them have the healthiest kids possible, which I don't know how you can be somebody who is opposed to that. But it highlights that genetic testing is so much more complicated than we give it credit for. And it's so much more than picking the eye color of your baby. Our goal is always a healthy baby, and we're trying to help our patients get to that goal in the way that is best for them. IVF is not a guarantee. It's a medical process. It has a lot of different variables. And one of the most common things that I hear is just that somebody wasn't prepared. They didn't have any expectations set about what the process should look like or what their numbers would be, how many eggs they might get, what their number of embryos would be, or even how many embryos they should have based on their family size. So often, clinics are just pushing patients through cycles, and unfortunately, IVF is often called an industry, meaning there's a business side to a lot of practices that are really large, and they might be backed by people who have other interests than what is best for the patient at their heart. This means it's up to you to advocate for yourself, to find a good clinic, and to ask all the right questions. I hate that that's how medicine is, but that's why this podcast exists, so that you can be as prepared as possible and your best advocate as we go.